Hey, Fiveable community, this is Kevin Steinhauser working with AP Language and Composition tonight. All right, so again, tonight's session is how to read the sources. Obviously, you're going to read the sources, but you've only got 15 minutes of recommended reading time. So we want to make sure that that time is really well spent. All right, so I'm going to take the first few minutes tonight looking at the expectations for a synthesis essay. Um, the last couple years, I have been an AP reader on the synthesis essay in particular. So I'm very well versed in the last couple of years of trends of uh, what uh, students who are successful do, and also the traps that a lot of students fall into, what a lot of students do to write a three or a four essay on that one to nine rubric. So we wanna make sure you're getting fives and higher. If you're shooting for a four or five on AP language, you really wanna shoot for that seven, eight, nine range. Um, nines are very hard to get, so nine doesn't have to be your goal, but seven is a pretty reasonable goal if you are shooting for that five. All right, so with that in mind, the number one expectation here is that it is your argument. This is essentially an argumentative essay. The clear difference here is that you must use sources. So number two's expectation is the exact same as an argumentative essay. Your claims are clear. And I recommend making them clear through your thesis statement at the end of your introduction paragraph and in your topic sentences of your body paragraphs. So three, cite a minimum of three different sources to support your claims. We'll talk about this more in depth in the coming weeks, uh, but a quick preview here. You will be provided, generally speaking, six, seven, or eight sources, and you should read through all six, seven, or eight sources, but you only need to cite three. So I actually recommend citing, I think the sweet spot's four sources. Um, now, you can certainly do three and be very successful. You can certainly do five and be very successful. Now, you, there's many, many ways to write an effective synthesis argument. However, I've seen a common trap where students think that they get like magic bonus points for citing or referencing or paraphrasing every single source. That is not the case at all. You are not penalized in the least by using three sources only. There's no bonus points. Uh, there's no secret pat on the backs for using more sources than your peers. It's all about how you use the sources. So that's a common misconception with synthesis. It, it, you do not get any reward for using more than three sources. It's all about how you use the sources you choose to use. So that's gonna be very helpful. If you come across a source when you're like, I have no idea how to use it, that happens a lot with the the graphic or the cartoon or whatever they provide that's a visual aid or a visual source. If you don't know how to use that visual source, don't use the visual source. Use three at least that you're pretty confident in and how you can use it effectively. All right, so again, more of that to come, but I wanted to make sure that was very clear from the, the um, beginning tonight. All right, number four, make connections between the sources. In other words, if source A and C are talking about the exact same topic, Use both of those in your body paragraph. See how they're connected. So you're making your claim, and then you're using multiple pieces of evidence from multiple different sources to support your claim. Again, we'll talk about general structure um, in the coming weeks, but I just wanted you, you to do tonight, before we dive into the source uh, practice tonight of reading sources, I wanted you to know exactly what um, you essentially you want to do with the final product. All right, and five is another common question. The common question is, if I have background knowledge on the topic, how much of that should I put into the essay? So I've said you may connect your background knowledge. In fact, if you have background knowledge, I encourage you to include it in your essay with caution. The synthesis sources themselves should drive your support. So we'll talk about that more practically, more tangibly in the coming weeks when we talk about how to put together a body paragraph. But I'll just put it this way. If you have some awesome background knowledge, either through your own experience or, your, or through different readings or studies that you've done, absolutely put them into your synthesis essay. But partner them with a source. Partner them with um, maybe source C. We'll talk about what I'm talking about here in a minute. So I've got source C, I've quoted, and then I say, hey, I've also seen this in my own life. And then you can do a couple sentences making source C practicable or practical to your reader by talking about it through your own lens. But it can't, 
you can't go rogue and talk mainly about your own experiences and observations and research. It, it needs to be driven through the sources. All right, so tonight we're gonna to talk about the 15 minutes. That's what this live session is all about. You will have two hours and 15 minutes to write all three essays on exam day this May. So the way that your exam is going to work for AP language, you will start off bright and early in the morning with 60 minutes for 55 multiple choice questions. That is worth 45% of your exam score. You have a quick little break. It's kind of a brain fresh. You just worked your butt off for an hour. You've got to just basically put all of that um, reading aside and just get really ready to go to read three essay prompts and write three full essays in two hours and 15 minutes. So the way that that calculates out, you have 15 minutes to read the prompts and then you have 40 minutes to write each essay. So most college board um, members and most teachers would recommend the way that I will recommend it here. Spend 15 minutes or so reading through just the synthesis essay. Write the synthesis essay. Usually that's going to go a little bit quicker than 40 minutes. Um, but let's just say for the sake of math, that takes you 40 minutes. That will give you 40 minutes to move into question two, the rhetorical analysis um, essay. And that will give you the last 40 minutes to write your argument essay. You can absolutely write these essays out of order. All you'll do at the top of the page is write question one, two, or three, whichever one is corresponding to your essay. Question one is synthesis. That's always going to be first. Question two is analysis. Question three is argument. It is totally up to you to pace yourself. The clock will be ticking. They, the proctor will tell you, you have two hours and 15 minutes, go. The proctor will tell you some time warnings, but the proctor will not require you um, to move from synthesis to analysis and from analysis to argument. So it's very important you don't get lost in one essay. You want to move at a very brisk pace. Now, you can absolutely finish one essay before the other, or be, before 40 minutes is up and move on to the other. Um, just keep in mind, you have to have a solid game plan. So if synthesis might take you 10 minutes to read the sources and then 30, 35 minutes to write, you've got an extra 10 minutes you just found. Maybe you need to spend more time on analysis. That is totally valid because analysis, you have to have a high level reading of the text before you can spend a lot of time writing about the text. With that in mind, I highly encourage you to use close to the 15 minutes, if not all of the 15 minutes for the synthesis score. I said at the beginning that I expect the synthesis essays to gradually be harder um, because they will just provide more reading for you. So yes, you have to read um, quickly, but I still believe that your best score can be like most people's best score, the synthesis essay. I wanna keep in mind something. Um, I'll get a score one through nine on synthesis. I'll get a score one through nine on analysis. I'll get a score one through nine on argument. Those three scores get combined together to give me my essay score. Again, the essay score is 55% of my exam. If I, if I can move my synthesis from a five to a six, that is just as impactful for my score than moving an analysis essay from a four to a five. So just keeping that in mind, we just want that big composite score. Now, clearly, I don't want to spend all day on synthesis to get a nine, only to not have enough time on the next two essays and get a three and a four, right? But keeping all of that in mind, College Board used to require you to spend 15 minutes pre-writing your synthesis essay. They gave you your synthesis sources. They said you have 15 minutes of reading time. The proctor said, okay, 15 minutes is up. You now may begin writing your essay. So you have two hours to write three essays. College Board um, changed that a couple years ago. And now you just have two hours and 15 minutes to, to plan um, and, and to write. The synthesis score is actually have slightly dipped since that change because a lot of students rush into the writing. So don't rush into the writing. However, if you feel confident and it's been 13 minutes, absolutely take those extra two minutes um, and get a head start on your synthesis essay. Absolutely, you are expected to use two hours and 15 minutes to, to plan, to write, and to do any proofreading revision that you can for all three essays. If you are ending early, you are at a disadvantage. So make sure you, you are using every possible minute. Let's talk about how I recommend using the first 15 minutes 
of the exam. So first, uh, and this is all about synthesis. First, you're going to read the synthesis prompt page. It will always be the first page. It'll say question one. Here's the synthesis prompt. We're going to talk about that for a couple minutes tonight of how to really effectively and quickly read through that page. Then uh, quickly but effectively read and annotate each source. As you're going, you should be thinking of your outline, like what am I going to write about? What are my claims and what evidence might I choose? And essentially, how might I use that evidence? And then lastly, um, you're just maybe some of you will actually write out a quick outline. Obviously, you're not going to write a beautiful outline. You don't have time. But maybe you'll brainstorm and, and uh, put some stuff on the page. Maybe you just got to do it in your head. It really is up to you. I generally recommend writing it out because especially on test day, you're, you're stressed, you're nervous to a certain extent. You don't want um, to say, oh, crap, I had it 10 minutes ago, and now I totally forget my second point. So it's just general advice uh, would be quick, quick, quick bullet points on what, where you're going and maybe what sources you're going to use. All right, so here's the prompt page. Let's talk about how to effectively read it. The prompt page is always going to have four components. They might be in a different order, but we're going to look at this sample prompt from a few years ago about memorials. We're going to actually use this prompt for the next few weeks um, to look at how would I put this together just so we're going, uh, we're streamlining the process here. If you stick with five of AP line sessions every Tuesday night, or if you're watching the replays, um, we're always going to be in this prompt for the next few weeks here. So the first component is background knowledge. And again, the components might be in a different order. They, they aren't super, super consistent with this. Uh, but this has generally been the trend the last few years. The first component will be background information about the topic you're going to choose to write an opinion about. Again, it has to be your own argument. So let's read the background knowledge from component one from this sample prompt. The need to memorialize events or people is complex. In some cases, monuments honor, mo I'm sorry, monuments honor moments of great achievement, while in other cases, monuments pay homage to deep sacrifice. A monument's size, location, and materials are all considerations in planning and creating a memorial to the past. This is basically to stimulate your background knowledge or to provide background knowledge if you have very minimal on the topic. So a quick note here. College Board in general um, is setting out to give you a topic that you have not written an essay about before. So they're not going to be common hot button issues um, like immigration. They're not going to be common um, argumentative debate topics um, like the death penalty or abortion or things like that or the legal age to drive or the legal age to drink. What it's going to be instead, they hope, is something that is a real issue in society but one that is not a hot topic of debate. So here, for example, monuments are a real issue. They're a day, daily issue across the country and really across the world. But you probably haven't spent a ton of time debating it with your peers. That's the, that's the sweet spot that College Board's looking for. Have you seen monuments? Yes, you probably have. Can you create an opinion about this in 40 minutes? Yes, you can. Will it be easy? Not necessarily. But they are going to be providing many sources uh, in which you can use to craft your opinion. Here's what I recommend, and I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. Have an opinion before you read the sources. That way, your reading time is better spent. You are looking for what agrees with you. You are not formulating your opinion on the fly. So we'll talk about um, how that's going to look in particular. So again, this component one, background info, is all about just providing some information that's going to be helpful to get you thinking about the topic today. Um, component two and, and this flow is right in the middle. These will be three separate paragraphs on the prompt page. They're not going to label component two prompt. They will have three separate paragraphs, uh, but this is essentially what this paragraph's function is. So here's the paragraph uh, that provides the prompt. Read the following seven sources carefully, including the introductory information for each source. Then, and I always encourage my students to underline the prompt, just so I can quickly go back and reread that a couple times as I'm writing to make sure I'm still fully answering the question. It's especially important in the argument essay and in the synthesis essay. 
So then in a well-organized essay that synthesizes at least three of the sources for support, that phrase will never change. You will always have to synthesize at least three sources. Examine the factors a group or agency should consider in memorializing an event or person and in creating a monument. So I've got to talk about a couple things here. I've got to talk about the factors that are important. And I've got to talk about um, not just considering who's memorialized and what's memorialized, but also the creation of the monument itself. All right, and then these are uh, component three. These directions are almost every year word for word, but they're always going to have it. I recommend taking the 10 seconds it takes to read them to ground yourself and to mentally prepare yourself for doing synthesis the right way. So I call these generic synthesis directions because no matter the topic, you're going to see something pretty close to this. Make sure your argument is central. I'm going to say it again. Make sure your argument is central. So many students think that synthesis should be a summary. We are not looking for um, the correct answer. We're looking for an effective argument. So let's keep reading. Use the sources to illustrate and support your reasoning. Avoid merely summarizing the sources. If you just summarize sources, you will probably get a one, two, or three on this exam, on this synthesis essay. Indicate clearly which sources you are drawing from, whether through direct quotation, paraphrase, or summary. You may cite the sources as source A or source B, et cetera, or by using the descriptions in parentheses. I'll show you um, what that is talking about in a second. In, in future weeks, we'll spend some time saying this is exactly how you grammatically cite the sources. Uh, we just want to make sure we do it the right way. And we also want to make sure we cite them clearly so we get credit for citing three different sources minimum. Um, I have read thousands of synthesis essays. I have very, very rarely read a synthesis essay in which the student does not cite three different sources. So most people are doing this the right way. Just make sure you are as well. If you do not cite three sources, if you do not use at least three sources as support, the highest essay you can get is a four. The highest score you can get is a four. This is the final component, and this will always be last. It'll be at the end of the page. It will look exactly like this. It will say source A, and then it will put in parentheses what you can call the source when you cite it. So you might say, according to Savage, comma, and then cite your source, or Savage says blank. Or you might paraphrase Savage, and then in parentheses, you'll say Savage, period, or source A, period. In, in essence, there's no right or wrong way to do it. In a, in a few weeks, I will talk about writing style and the nuance of synthesis writing in terms of citations. But for today, there's technically no right or wrong way. Um, you can either do source A every time, or you can do the parentheses every time. Um, but again, in a few weeks, I'll get into the higher levels of writing in which you're going to be strategic of, are you going to call it source A? Are you going to call it um, whatever's in parentheses? All right, before you flip the prompt page, take a minute, maybe less than a minute, but quick, 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 brainstorm your ideas. So here, let's go back to the what I underlined, the prompt. Examine the factors a group or agency should consider in memorializing the better person and in creating a monument. So here, I have to identify the factors. So here's why I want you to identify your own factors or whatever um, it's asking you to do, your own opinion and ideas about the topic before flipping the page. If you flip the page, you're going to see some very effective writing through sources A, B, C, D, E, F. I don't want you to be swayed by the sources. I want you to critically think about the sources. So if you're still developing your own opinion about it, about the topic, um, it's very easy to say, oh, wow, source A. Totally right. I totally agree with them. And then go to source B. Source B completely disagrees with source A, let's say, and say, wow, source B is making some good points too. Now I don't know what to believe. So that's very common and that's very um, much a trap of the prompt. Don't let the sources drive your opinion. Your opinion drives your use of the sources. So in this case, I'm just going to take 10 seconds, uh, 15 seconds, 20 seconds to jot this list down. Now, these are the first things that come to my mind. These might not be what I ultimately use. I'm probably only going to use a couple of these on my actual essay, but 
but I've got cost is a, is a major factor, location, public perception, the environmental impact, and the economic impact of creating memorials and monuments. Now, what I do is start reading the sources and see which sources line up with mine. Guys, if, if let's say I, I'm really passionate about, about location, but no source really gives me much to work with, cross it out, I'm gonna choose something different to write about. Likewise, if I'm like, okay, I thought of public perception, I'm not really passionate about it, but if three or four sources give me something to work with and I really can go somewhere with it, absolutely use it. So you obviously want to have more possible claims, because here would be my claims, right? Cost is an important factor. Location is an important factor, um, et cetera. So these are my claims. These are my factors. I want to have more than I would have to ultimately use because then I'm going to be able to let the sources guide me narrowing down my topic. Again, let me be clear here. The sources are not narrowing down your ideas. The sources are narrowing down um, the support that I can use or the way that I can express my ideas. I hope that's clear. Um, basically, what I'm getting at here is know your opinion, but let the sources tweak your claims. In other words, let the sources tweak what you're going to write about. Write about what the sources allow you to write about very effectively. While you read, let's say you're going to take the next 10 to 12 minutes reading and annotating the sources. I want you to quickly, carefully read, but I also want you to annotate. Annotate synthesis sources. You've heard me say this all year if you've been part of Fiverr. Annotate to save you time and to make sure you're reading at a high level of each source. Now you want to do this quickly. You're not going to write. You're not going to write huge um, like paraphrases in the margins here, but you are going to make some notes to yourself to save time for later, especially when it comes to okay, out of all seven sources I have, which ones am I going to cite in my own essay? All right. So start narrowing down your focus. Um, as you read. Here's how I recommend that you annotate during synthesis. Underline phrases that you might quote in your essay. They don't have to be full sentences. Maybe it's just a power word. Maybe it's a power phrase. I'll show you some models of that here tonight. Again, I don't have time to reread an entire synthesis essay. I, I, annotations is so crucial here because you are literally going to be quoting from multiple sources. I don't have time to say, oh crap, I think it's in source A, but I don't remember where it is. Underline the stuff you might go back to. Now for some prompts, you're gonna write an A for every time you agree and a D for every time you disagree. That's what I recommend. That's just gonna again, narrow down what out of all the sources might you actually reference in your essay. However, there, there might be a prompt like the one um, from tonight where it asks you to consider factors. So instead, and this is what I'll model through tonight for a few sources, write the factor being addressed in the margin. If I, let's go back to my factor. If I see cost, I'm just gonna write, underline a phrase and write cost. If I see location, I'm gonna write location. Uh, that's just gonna help me narrow down what I'm gonna talk about. If I only write cost one time throughout seven sources, I'm probably not going to use it. I wanna look for something that the sources give me room to play with and room to work with. Okay. We're gonna practice a few prompts tonight. I wanna to always start with looking at the box that they call the source information at the beginning. Take always 10 seconds to read it and um, the italic one sentence most likely immediately below it. This is what College Board provides. So the first is a citation. So the way to read this, and it's important that you all can read this because A, it just makes synthesis go quick. You don't have to spend time thinking about what these pieces are. But B, you will probably get some questions on multiple choice this year um, that are just asking you to break down citation information. So what we've got here, um, this is the author, Lawrence Downs. This is the title of the work, Waiting for Crazy Horse. It was published in the New York Times. This is, again, the publisher. And this is the date. Now, it was republished on the Internet on December 20th, 2010. If this wasn't here, it would just have been a print magazine, right? So if you see two dates, the first one's when it was in print, the second one's when it was on the internet. The following is excerpted from an online opinion article published in a major newspaper. 
this is important to look at very, very quickly just to ground yourself. Start thinking, is there bias in the article or not? It's unclear if there's going to be bias. And also, how credible is this? Um, the more credible the source, uh, the least you might be able to detect the flaws in the source. So synthesis, you might actually be able to address the counter argument by citing a source and saying, this is why the source is wrong. This is why, yeah, source C has a point, but source C didn't think of the big picture. So we'll get more specific and tangible in the coming weeks when I'm actually writing uh, what I'm looking at. But for now, let's just focus on a high level reading in preparation of writing this essay. So each slide is going to look like this uh, for each source. I'm going to tell you what I would underline, and I'm going to um, just jot down the factors that I see. So we're going to quickly go through source C. Um, this source C is longer than the next couple, so we're not going to take a whole lot of time discussing and talking, but I want your eyes on, again, how would you quickly and effectively read through this? So you already are thinking about, here's what sources, um, I'm sorry, here's what factors I might use. Now let's see which sources have what factor. I skipped to source C. Uh, we're just going to look at some of the sources tonight. All right, so source C begins. The carving of this South Dakota peak into a mounted likeness of Crazy Horse, the great Sioux leader, has been going on since 1948. It's a slow job. After all this time, only his face is complete. So we're talking about a huge um, carving of Crazy Horse, the Sioux leader. The rest, his broad chest and flowing hair, his outstretched arm, his horse, is still encased in stone, not carved out yet. Someday, long after you are dead, it may finally emerge. In other words, anyone who's alive in 20, 2009, this author does not believe in that person's lifetime this process will be done. Hey, it's been going on for more than 50 years, basically 60 years at this point, and we've only got a space. So mathematically, that makes sense. He's probably not going to have this sculpture done. So I don't know where this where this author is going here yet, but the factors that I see are cost and time. Time was not on my original list, but I'm going to jot it down. If I keep seeing time come up again and again, maybe I'll write about it in my essay. All right, keep going. The memorial outside Rapid City is only a few miles from Mount Rushmore. Both are great, sorry, I'll say it again. Both are tributes to greatness. One is a federal monument and national icon, Mount Rushmore. The other, a solitary dream, Crazy Horse. A sculptor, Korzak Zulowski, worked at it alone for more than 30 years, roughing out the shape while acquiring a mighty beard and a large family. He died in 1982 and is buried in front of the mountain. His widow, Ruth, lives at the site and continues the mission with her many children. All I'm really getting here, so you'll see, I wanted you to see there's paragraphs where I, I definitely am likely to quote or definitely likely to reference because of a factor. There's also paragraphs where I'm just going to quickly read it, maybe jot something down, maybe underline something, maybe not. Um, I'm only annotating for what I might eventually use. Now, guys, I don't know that after just reading Source A, so I want to give myself a lot of things to play with here, but I'm not over-annotating for sure. I underlined one sentence, and I just noted, okay, this is a factor of who and what is being worth um, memorialized. Both are tributes to greatness. We memorialize greatness. But really, I'm moving on. Maybe you could say, yeah, I see time here as well. Absolutely. All right, let's go. I have to admit, so now he shifts into um, an opinion, I think, a little bit more clearly here. Mount Rushmore bothers me. It was bad enough that white men drove the Sioux from hills they still hold sacred. Did they have to carve faces all over them too? Clearly being very critical here. It's easy to feel affection for Mount Rushmore's strange grandeur, but only if you forget where it is and how it got there. To me, it's too close to graffiti. Being very critical here of Mount Rushmore took a turn that I did not see coming I thought this was just going to be about how Crazy Horse is taking so long to be um, captured in this monument. So I see here um, location, and also again, who and what is worth being memorialized. And I think I'm tying these two things together in my head. 
was it worth memorializing four American presidents on Native American sacred land? That's the question that the author is making you ask. All right, we're going to keep reading so we'll see. The Crazy Horse Memorial has some of the same problems. This is interesting. As I'm reading, I'm just quickly thinking, what are the problems? Because they're memorializing a Native American leader on Native American land. But let's read. Let's see where he goes here. It is most definitely an unnatural landmark. Okay, so that's the problem that he's identifying, the fact that it's an unnatural landmark on sacred lands. Some of the Indians I met in South Dakota voiced their own misgivings, starting with the fact that it presumes to depict a proud man who was never captured in a photograph or drawn from life. In other words, we have no photographic or artistic renderings of Crazy Horse. How are we going to make a sculpture out of that? Um, so locations that I see are societal perception as well as location. Societal perception, um, for this, it doesn't have to mean society at large, everybody, but just parts of society. So the Native American population might have misgivings about the location and the um, unnatural landmark itself. So that's the society that I'm thinking of here. It's their land. All right. Kelly Looking Horse, a Sioux artist I talked with as he sewed a skin drum at Mount Rushmore, said there were probably better ways to help Indians than a big statue. So again, some cynicism coming in here, or some criticism at least. He also grumbled that many of the crafts for sale at the memorial were made by South Americans and Navajos and sold to people who wouldn't know the difference among Indian tribes or care. Leatrice Chick Big Crow, who runs a boys and girls club at the Pine Ridge Reservation, said she thought the memorial was one of those things that could go on swallowing money and effort forever. That definitely is coming back into cost. Um, I also see time in this paragraph as well, as well as continued societal perceptions, specifically thinking of the Na Native American society. So nothing new here, just more of the same factors, but some good evidence that I can still pick out potentially. But two other Sioux artists, Charlie Sitting Bull, a weaver of intricate beadwork, and Cloud, a watercolorist, said they were grateful at least that the memorial gave them free space to show and sell their work. So there's some nuance here. There's actually some benefits, even though on the whole it seems pretty negative in terms of the society um, of the Native Americans. They seem to have a negative opinion about it, but they are also recognizing there are some added benefits. As for the loss of the Black Hills, it seems to be a pretty big um, negative there. They've lost the Black Hills. Mr. Ironcloud told me without rancor that there wasn't much to be done about it now, or is this too late to change it? So it's negative, but what are we going to do? So I'm still thinking location, I'm thinking cost, I'm thinking the perceptions of the Native Americans. Looking up at the mountain in the golden light of late afternoon, it was hard not to be impressed, even moved, by this effort to honor the memory of a people this country once tried mightily to erase. So clearly here we're talking about the crazy horse statue. We're honoring a Native American legend. I came away reminded that eternity is not always or not on our side. The nearby South Dakota Badlands, made of soft and crumbling sediment and ash, will be gone in a geological instant. So here, in addition to location, I've just added the factor longevity. We want to make sure we're building monuments to last, or at least that's a factor that we want to consider. How long will this monument last? Right. The day may sooner come when most human works have worn away as well. Again, I'm focusing on my longevity uh, factor here. When all is lost to rust and rot, what remains may be two enormous granite oddities in the Great Plains. Four men's heads mysteriously huddled cheek to cheek, a forgotten album cover, and far bigger, a full-formed Indian on a horse, his eyes ablaze his long arm pointing out over his beloved Black Hills. Definitely ending with the idea of longevity here. All right, we're going to shift quickly to source B. I want to look at a few sources with you tonight. Um, just looking at that high-level reading, next week we'll start talking about how to put them together effectively. All right, so again, we've got the author. We've got the title of the work. We've got the um, publisher. It says this came from a local newspaper. We've got the date. The, fo the following is excerpted 
from an article published in a local newspaper. All right, completely shifting gears here, but we're still under the, the memorial umbrella. My job is to realize um, what might I use, what might I not use. My job is to realize how these things work to prove my points. All right, Grandma Mary Pallet must be turning in her grave. The bones of Pallet, she lived in 1796 to 1889, and thousands of other San Gabriel Valley pioneers buried at Savannah Memorial Park could be moved to make way for a future development. Already, and maybe I'm not jotting all of these down, I'm jotting down quickly, quickly, uh, but I'm seeing the factors at play here. If I see factors across multiple sources, that makes it more likely that I choose to write about that factor in my essay. Actually, all four of these factors from the get-go, we just saw in source C. So I see cost, I see location, I see societal perception, I see longevity. So longevity, for example, meaning um, even though I, I do want to point out before we go any further, this is a different kind of monument memorial, right? But it, it's still the same concept. So when I have a memorial, I have to anticipate she probably was buried in 1889. What's it going to be a hundred some years later? Are future generations going to want to remove that memorial for other purposes like this? So that's why I'm thinking of longevity. That's why I'm thinking of location. I'm also thinking of cost here uh, because we are only moving this grave site or these bones because there's an economic incentive, right? And then lastly, societal perception. I'm wondering what her ancestors and what that city would think about um, moving the bones. Would this be a positive or negative in their eyes? I just have to consider that. Let's keep reading to see uh, which factor kind of takes over uh, the source here. Unless something happens and we get the money from somewhere, I don't know how we're going to make it, said Rosie Gutierrez, treasurer for the El Monte Cemetery Association, which owns the four-acre graveyard at 9263 Valley Boulevard. So obviously cost is popping off the page right now. So I had a lot that it, it could have went to. I'm definitely seeing cost as a major factor. The association has enough money to keep the place open at least two years, said Bob Bruch, vice president of the association and Garvey School District board member. Developers have an eye for the cemetery site, and the community of Asian businesses and residents nearby would like to see it gone because they think it brings bad luck, Bruch added. So I'm thinking location. I'm still thinking cost. Um, maybe not as a driving factor here, but it's not, it's not super far gone because there's a business incentive for removing the cemetery site. All right, but Savannah is rich in history and should be preserved, Bruce argues. The pioneers from the Santa Fe Trail would bring their dead along with them, preserve somehow, and bury them here. More than 3,000 graves fill the cemetery, dated as early as 1847. Bruce said more graves are scattered under Valley Boulevard and beneath area businesses, certainly thinking location here. The area was also an Indian burial ground before the corpses of settlers filled the place, Bruce said. Bruce said the association would go for historical landmark status with the state, but fears of lack of resources to pull it off. Okay, so clearly resources um, in part equals cost. So cost is, again, jumping out of the, out of the page. Um, again, only underlining things I might end up quoting. Clearly, I'm going to have way more underlined than quoted in my essay, but I've definitely taken the first step of narrowing down um, the most quotable portions here. All right, if the cemetery was sold for development, the association or developer would have to move the graves to another location and notify every relative. That task could cost millions of dollars, Bruce said. The association has about 200 more plots it could sell for $1,000 a piece, but it would not bring enough cash to keep Savannah running, Gutierrez said. I don't know what the solution is. I really don't, Gutierrez said. It's going to take a city like Rosemead to take care of it. Moving to source E. Um, source D, the main factors I saw were location and cost. I'm moving quickly because I want to get through four sources with you tonight. Uh, this is four of the seven sources um, that was provided for this prompt. All right, so we got the author. We've got the title. We've got the publisher, which is a website, and we've got the date. The following is excerpted from an article published on a website for freelance writers and journalists. So the reason why we must have two 
um, dates here is it was published twice. So that, that's what we've got um, as our takeaway here. Let's go ahead and start. It had to be done, but is the mall in Washington, D.C. the proper place, so I'm picking location, for a museum that is dedicated to victims and survivors of the Holocaust? It is not surprising that immediate and intense controversy erupted when plans were publicized to build a Holocaust museum on the mall in Washington, D.C. The controversy grew from Jewish and non-Jewish communities, primarily due to the fact that a museum dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust would be built in the United States, who did little to stop the Holocaust from occurring. Or as one protester said, imagine a Holocaust museum in the town whose political sages refused to lift a finger to halt the Holocaust or open our shores to the few survivors. How offensive to any informed individual. So I've underlined, in, I've underlined the most, I call it quotable quotes, the quotes that most succinctly and effectively prove the point that they're being made. I really am focusing here. Uh, I don't know where this essay is, or the source is going yet, but I'm really interested in this factor, societal perception. Clearly location's a part of it. That's what especially the first few sentences we're talking about. Um, but really, there was backlash, there was controversy. Where's this going? But a factor that clearly I must anticipate is societal perception. Are, will there be controversy because of this memorial or not, and why? All right, as the controversy grew, the supporters of the museum felt that building a museum on the mall would enhance the mall's already diverse stories. For example, George Will, a political columnist, states no other nation has a broader, graver responsibility in the world. No other nation more need citizens trained to look life in the face. So I'm still looking at societal perception here. All right, Holocaust Museum Design is the subheading under this source. The design of the building encouraged further controversy. So I, I'm still thinking of societal perception, but I'm adding the factor design. Hey, this is the first time I've seen this in three sources, but I'm still going to track the factors. Maybe it's in some other sources yet. Supporters did not want a duplicate of other buildings on the mall, nor did they want something that would cause further anti-Semitism or to downplay the atrocities of the Holocaust. So design actually can work in tandem with societal perception to avoid controversy. So obviously uh, an agency's goal would be to avoid controversy. Well, at least you could assume that, right? All right, the Commission of Fine Arts refused the first design stating the design was too massive. The members of the commission felt the massive building would overcome the mall and take away the main purpose of the museum, which was meant to be a place of remembrance and not to overpower the mall or its visitors. So size honestly still is working in tandem here with societal perception. Alert Abraham was ready to scratch, <laughs> alert, Albert Abraham was ready to scratch the design until he realized that the design could still work by downsizing it. So still talking about size here, still not overly enthused by the design, it was approved by the commission. Eventually, the commission would decide not to use Abraham's firm and ask James Ingo Freed to design the museum. That's actually the end of source E. I think the most interesting part of source E is happening here. I wanna reread this quote before I move on to source F, our last source of the night. The museum felt, Marie Roy underlined, that building a museum on the mall would enhance the mall's already diverse stories. So we saw controversy, but we have a positive outcome here. So because the agencies um, who were in charge of this, or the agency who was in charge of this, considered the controversy, weighed it, and planned accordingly, um, they made sure and I could argue this in your essay, that their museum honored history, did not rewrite history, uh, did not sugarcoat history, but made sure this diverse story was told appropriately. All right, so we're gonna do one more source tonight. Why I wanted to choose source C, E, D, and F is so you can get a good sense of synthesis. Synthesis um, has seven to six, seven or eight sources that all apply to the topic, 
you want to make connections between the two, but the connections most of the time will not be super obvious. Sometimes they will. In fact, some si sometimes source C might reference explicitly back to source A, but that is rare. What's not rare is something like you'll see here, a throwaway source, which most people do not use effectively. Again, don't use a source if you don't know how you want to use it. But let's end tonight looking at source F before we wrap up. We've got our title, we've got our um, publisher, and we've got our date. This was from 2010. The following is an entry in an online guide to offbeat tourist attractions. Not nearly as important probably as source C, um, D, and E, but let's take it a read and let's see if we might use it in our essay. H. L. Ray Johnson made money trapping lobsters, made money trapping lobsters, and lived in Harpswell, Maine. In 1939, he posed for a sculpture titled The Maine Lobsterman, kneeling before his favorite crustacean while pecking its claw. I'm pausing. I'm already thinking. The factor I'm seeing here is who or what's worth being memorialized. Um, you might be able to argue that an, a lobsterman in 1939 is worth being memorialized, but you might say, why did this guy get memorialized? How did that happen? The sculpture was supposed to be cast in bronze and made part of the main exhibit at the 1939 New York World's Fair. But Maine ran out of money, so I'm thinking cost immediately. So the artist just slapped a coat of bronze paint over the plaster model and shipped it to New York. After the fair ended, the fake bronze statue returned to Maine and spent several decades being moved from city hall to museum to museum. No one seemed to want the man and his lobster. I'm underlining that, that's a great quotable quote, if I choose to use this source at all. Again, who or what is worth being memorialized? No one wanted this random lobster man. That's even worse. The statue was vandalized, repaired, and ended up being in a warehouse where it was eaten by rats. It wasn't until poor H. Elroy Johnson died that a bronze cast was finally made of the statue, and eight years after that, 1981, it was moved to Washington, D.C. and dedicated in 1983. It was dedicated by the Campfire Girls of Cundy's Harbor, Maine, and reportedly cost $30,000. Okay, I'm thinking cost. <laughs> a close inspection may reveal tooth marks, but we aren't promising anything. So again, this is an offbeat um, tourist attraction guide. So they're saying, yeah, go check this out. It's this really random uh, sculpture that was once eaten by rats. Something in cost, but really here I'm thinking, what's worth being memorialized? If you memorialize and go into the effort of memorializing something that nobody cares about, look what might happen. All right, here's our final reminders tonight. So synthesis is all about your own argument. Therefore, I want you to drive your reading of the sources. I don't want them driving your ideas. Now, you, again, be clear, this, there's some nuance here. Reading the sources should indicate to you, yeah, I can talk about this claim because I've got stuff in the sources to back up my claim. I'm going to be able to use this source to back up my claim. Um, but you should know what you believe before flipping the page of the prompt. Okay, second, briskly read through each source, annotate as you go. You do not need to use every source, but you should read every source. You do not have time to read every source twice but you do have time to quickly and effectively read through the source. All right, we're doing weekly live streams, guys, through February. It's all about synthesis. Next week, we're looking at a high level, um, what are the next steps? Once I've read all 15 sources, what do I specifically do? I certainly hope you can join me again next week. I, if you are in the live sessions, always feel free to reach out for in-time questions. If not, replays are great um, as well. So as long as you're keeping up, that is the best thing that you can do for your weekly AP language review. All right, guys, I look forward to next Tuesday and I will see you then.